Nicodemus says to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you don't understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. So what does this mean? To us biblically ignorant, illiterate Gentiles, I don't know, it doesn't really mean much to us at all. But to a Pharisee like Nicodemus, who knows the Exodus story forward and backward, and that's like their whole culture is built around this story of the Exodus, this is powerful imagery. He knows exactly what Jesus is speaking of. He is referring to Numbers 21, verses 5 through 9. And it says, And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there's no food and water, and we loathe this worthless food. Now keep in mind that worthless food they're talking about is the manna that came from heaven to feed them on a daily basis. And Jesus tells us, he is the real manna that comes from heaven. So the people who just got saved out of Egypt, out of their bondage, are basically calling Jesus worthless. They're rejecting Christ. They're not appreciating what God did for them and rejecting Christ. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent, set it on a pole. And if the serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. Now this is a beautiful testament to the axiom that Augustine said this is kind of a lot more merm, uh, modern language version of what Augustine said. It says, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. And the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. If you only had this story from Numbers, it seems kind of kooky. It's a little strange. Um, but now that we have the Gospel, we see that it is a perfect foreshadowing of what is to come. The Bible is not just history recorded. It's also a revelation that God is the master storyteller. And every little part of history has been laid down meticulously so that every event was planned before the very foundation of the world. There are no random, irrelevant stories in the Old Testament. The entire book points to Christ. All the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is the story of God's redemptive work reconciling man to himself through the sacrifice of his son. So in this story from the Torah, what do we have? First we have man doing what he always does. Groaning and complaining about his situation instead of appreciating what God has done for him. In other words, man sinning against both his creator and at this point his savior. Now keep in mind, this is happening shortly after they saw all the great signs and wonders of God coming out of Egypt. So this whole idea we have, oh, if I could only see, I would believe. It's a fallacy, it's nonsense, and Jesus will address that in our next lesson. It's not a matter of you see things, it won't even matter. So they're sinning, so God in His justice punishes them for their rebellion. Now it's funny how your perspective changes as you age. If your only experience in life so far is being a child, you might be aghast. Like, why would God send these snakes to like bite his people and kill his people? Contrary, if you've grown up and you're a parent who's raised an unappreciative child, 
or you've been in a leadership position for a while, or even if you've been in ministry long enough and you see how uh, stiff-necked and obstinate people are not wanting to hear the Word of God, your perspective kind of changes and no longer are you like, why would God send serpents to bite his, his people? You're like, wow, is he forgiving? Like They just asked for forgiveness and he's sending them salvation like that. But that's how God works. It's exactly the same in the Old Testament as it is in the New. So if you have a dispensational idea of it, being different, throw away that nonsense. In all periods of history, God has always worked the same. The law tells us what we must do, and grace covers what we can. So the serpent's bite, the serpent should be pretty obvious symbolism. Who's the serpent in the garden? We know that. Satan. Uh, his bite, his sin, and what does his bite do to us? Brings death. So Moses made this fiery serpent. He set it on a pole. And everyone who was bitten by sin, if they would look to their sin on the pole, they could be relieved of their sin. That poison which infected them is transferred to the object of their faith. So in the Old Testament, God provided a mere symbol to foreshadow the ultimate and forever sacrifice on a pole years later. 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us, God made him who had no sin to become sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. When Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. When Jesus told Nicodemus this in his private lesson, it likely had more impact on him than any of the public proclamations, public lessons, and all the miracles he displayed. Because Jesus was revealing to him the redemptive plan. Jesus would be placed on a stake and lifted up so that anyone who looks on him would be healed. Eternal life is now possible for everyone. Not through religious rituals or any futile effort at keeping the law, but instead by looking to Christ. The one who had no sin, yet was made sin for us so that we could become the righteousness of God. In John 12, 32, Jesus says, And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. And this is exactly what happened. When Jesus was crucified, Nicodemus was there. He's present at the cross. But unlike all the other Pharisees, he's not mocking and ridiculing him at this point. This mysterious Holy Spirit that Jesus is explaining to him in John 3, by the time we get to the end, it has moved Nicodemus' heart. He now understands the Scriptures not just with his mind, but he understands the gospel with his heart. Nicodemus had become a believer and was a follower of Jesus. He wasn't swayed by the miracles or the promise of power that most of his fellow Jews were looking for. It was when Jesus was lifted up as a sacrifice for our sin that Nicodemus was forever moved. When Jesus was lifted up, he drew Nicodemus to him. So the question tonight is where do you stand? You like the old Nicodemus who's willing to meet Jesus at night but all of your friends don't know about it? Or are you drawn to the Lord when you see Him lifted up? Will you look to the cross putting your poison upon Christ so that He can impart His righteousness to you? Question is, are you born again? If you are, great. We are partaking of communion in a few minutes. And as we do, it's a reminder of what Jesus did for us on the cross. It's basically a Christian version of us looking to the serpent on the pole. It's 
so that our sins can be washed away and we're made whole. If you are not born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus made it clear. But he also provided a way. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So I'm going to repeat to you the same thing Peter told his audience. Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So if you want to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, we're going to say a prayer in a minute, and the church is doing baptism soon, so get with me after the service. And I'll hook you up so we can get you baptized. Uh, so you can announce to the world your new status. You're now blood-bought, heaven-bound, saint, a child of God. 